All right, we are live. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 40 of the Tech Forge podcast. Seriously, it's 40 now? Yeah, we are up to episode 40. I can't believe it, dude. There's and no so, way we're up to episode 40. Just think, in 12 more episodes, we'll have been doing this for over a year. Oh my gosh. It doesn't really feel like that, you know? It, it doesn't honestly feel like we've been doing this for nearly a year. No, it doesn't, but... I mean, honestly, it feels like we've been doing this for, I don't know, maybe 10 episodes? 40. <laughs> That's insane if you think about it. That's pretty awesome. Yep. So, of course, I am your host, Dynamo Ned, and I am joined by my ever-faithful co-host, Jason and was going to be joined by Hunter, but sadly, the storms in his area have knocked out his internet. So, Yeah, he and Mother Nature are constantly fighting. It's like, so there's, some, it's, it's like there's some old married couple or something. Like, they're constantly bickering at each other. I fine. guess that is one way to look at it. Yeah, Mother Nature's like, well, fine, bicker me. We'll just give you another tornado. That poor guy. Hmm. All right, we do have some good stuff to talk about this week. Mm -hmm. Of course, the biggest news was the uh, well, somewhat mediocre release of NVIDIA's GTX 1650. Okay, not pulling any punches. <laughs> Going right I mean, there. There's no need to bury the lead. You're absolutely right, Ned. <laughs> uh, we have some more leaks about the Ryzen 3000 series APUs. And, well, Intel's not having a great day on the stock market. Really? Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about that more in a little bit. But according to MarketWatch, their stock plummeted today because they released some bad revenue figures. Oh. <laughs> Man, Intel, Intel, Intel. Starts with Qualcomm, ends with the bad stock. But okay. before we get into all that, we'll take a look at some of the... Uh, some of the miscellaneous stories out there this week. Okay. And this first one comes from TechCrunch, which is a new cryptocurrency mining malware uses leaked NSA exploits to spread across enterprise networks. That's kind of scary sounding. Yeah. So uh, we know that uh, roughly two years ago, there was an entire toolkit of NSA hacking tools that... Mm -hmm were some very highly classified exploits into some popular software that had been originally built by the National Security Agency that got leaked into the wild. <laughs> well, leaked isn't really the right word. They were stolen and published into the wild. <laughs> and this week, some security researchers at Norton slash Symantec say that they've seen a recent spike in a malware that they have dubbed Beepy. B-E-A-P-Y. It uses some of these hacking tools combined with a cryptocurrency mining algorithm to enslave computers to generate cryptocurrency as part of a bot network. You know, whoever comes up with some of these names, I wonder if they, if they explicitly give it really silly or cute sounding names just to lower the, the threat the perceived threat that they could provide. I don't know. Well, BP uh, really dude. That sounds like, like a really bad, a really bad Disney knockoff movie that you don't take your kids to go see. <laughs> it does. I mean, that's fair, but I mean, we've had some of the, some of the names for exploits, you know, sometimes it's from the, the name of the malware itself, like want to cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. But, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, a lot of these researchers just go for something that is easy and memorable. And sometimes, yeah, that does mean it winds up being kind of cutesy, like beepy. Yeah, so, so they go home and they're looking for inspiration, you know, for the next, the next code name they're going to give something. And they probably, you know go way over over crazy on their on their medical prescription and then they they use whatever comes to mind when they're in their haze of of 
of interesting, you know, mental perspective. So I don't know. That's crazy. That's silly. Yeah. In particular, BP uses two NSA developed exploits to help itself spread through enterprise networks. The first being the double pulsar malware, which creates a persistent backdoor into the computer that the botnet can then access. And then it uses the eternal blue exploit to spread laterally through the network. Mm. And both of these are known malware that leaked as part of the 2017 WannaCry ransomware. So what does it do? It hijacks your system to basically mine for cryptocurrency? Basically. Am I reading this right? Huh. Okay. And so this is basically the latest in the part of the newest wave of malware, which are called crypto jackers, because they hijack your computer to mine cryptocurrency for other people. <laughs> well, at so, least they're, they're generating money for somebody. I don't know. Uh, based on their most recent assessment in September of 2018, Symantec estimates that 919,000 computers are still vulnerable to the eternal blue exploit that is used in the BP malware. Nice. And more recent estimates put that estimate well over a million. So they exploit vulnerabilities in websites. Pretty much. Ah, so they basically download from whenever you uh, access the site. Interesting. Yeah, and instead of being a instead of being a browser based malware where mm -hmm. it only works as long as you have the site open, this actually downloads a file to your computer and basically makes your system run all the time crypto jacked. Interesting. And they estimate that in a single month, a file-based mining botnet, essentially, like this one, could generate up to $750,000 in a month. I wonder what kind of... Uh, so if it's a botnet, I wonder if it's a CPU or GPU or both type of... Uh, well, a lot of that would depend on miner. what type of coin and what type of miner BP is using, which they don't mention that fact in this article. Right. I'm just interested in the tech behind it as well. That's well, uh, they do have a link to some of the additional information from Symantec in the article, which, of course, we include a link down below in the description to all of the articles that we reference in our show. Uh, we use one tab to condense all of them into a single link where you can see them all on one page. Dude, one tab needs to pay you, man. Seriously. You're constantly giving them, you know, props. Well, I mean, it's a free extension that can be found for both Chrome and for Firefox. And it can also be a useful memory management tool because it basically lets you collapse a whole bunch of tabs into a single tab that you can then restore at any mm -hmm. time you choose. Yeah, it's a nice feature, or it's a nice extension. So, and so basically, the the moral of this story is: if you're running an enterprise network, make sure that you're protected against the double pulsar and the eternal blue exploits, and that way you probably won't have to worry about being crypto jacked. Mm. That's good advice, Senor. All right, what we got next? Oh, yes. Uh, this article is from Wired UK. It's, what do the PS5 specs tell us about the future of PlayStation versus Xbox? <laughs> now, we talked a little bit last week about the leaked specifications. Well, I say leaked, but uh, they were just kind of talked about in an interview between Wired and one of the senior architects on the PlayStation 5. Okay. And of course, we know that it's going to be an 8-core Zen 2-based CPU with simultaneous multi-threading. Mm -hmm. It is going to contain a custom version of the Navi GPU, 
that is upcoming from AMD. Mm -hmm. We know it's going to contain a GDDR6 memory. The exact mm -hmm. amount wasn't ever mentioned. Right. Also and an SSD. It is going to use an SSD for storage. And basically, it's going to be a... They're aiming for performance of what we would consider to be a mid-range PC. Well, the biggest upgrades with the architecture that they have mentioned is going to be the upgrade from a Jaguar-based CPU to a Zen-based CPU, and obviously the SSD. So no more 5,400 spin RPM, you know, rusty rusty iron or whatever. Like that, Those two right there are going to be huge upgrades from the PS4. And the thing is, the PS4 basically sits atop the current heat of consoles. Uh, the PlayStation 4 currently holds 58% market share in the eighth generation of consoles. Really? With the Xbox One at 27% and the Nintendo Switch at 15 Interesting. Well, the, the, the PS4 has been a big seller ever since it debuted, so that doesn't, that particular metric doesn't exactly surprise me. Well, that combined with the fact that the PlayStation did have a number of exclusives. It has PlayStation VR, a number of other features that the other consoles either don't match or can't match. Mm -hmm. And so the question becomes, given what we know about the PS5 now, how is Sony going to maintain its dominance? You know, we've talked about what those are looking like from a hardware perspective. But uh, this Wired article goes into a lot further analysis of what those specs mean. But in particular, uh, Jason, as you noted, a lot of what the article talks about is the fact that there's a number of things going into the ninth generation of consoles that Microsoft actually has an edge on. Well, so they're, I mean, they're, 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 one of their main revenue streams is catering to developers, you know, whether that, and that's through software development, you know, whether that's for any one of their uh, pretty sizable number of platforms. I mean, if you think, so I don't know if they're still doing much in the mobile sector, but uh, they've got Surface. They've got Windows 10, all of their uh, different flavors of Windows 10. So they've got enterprise, server, all that stuff. Um, they also have a software development package called VSTS or Visual Studio, which is huge for them. Um, and then obviously Xbox, right? So, and Azure. So with Azure, they're very, very experienced with cloud computing. And uh, uh, they're very mature in that aspect. So uh, I think what this article kind of kind of is highlighting is the fact that they're looking to compete with Google's upcoming stream only console, uh, the Stadia. And uh, so there's there's a few takeaways that we can get to in a moment from this article, which are not correct, but that aside, I think the big takeaway for me with this article is the fact that they're looking to enter that streaming market. Um, and I think Sony is, while Sony does have a streaming service, which is pretty decent, uh, I don't know if they can necessarily compete with a Microsoft that's got several years of experience with, with Azure software development and cloud services. Now, I don't know what Google has to uh, compete with on that per from that perspective, but um, it's interesting because we know that Microsoft is going to compete with PS5 uh, with a console that should be kind of uh, comparable in performance. You know, yeah. If, if what we heard about Xbox Scarlet 
uh, is anything to go by. The specs do sound extremely similar to what's been announced for the PS5. Mm -hmm. And so um, you and I were talking about this a little bit before, but uh, I think what we're probably going to see from Microsoft is we will see a successor to the Xbox One S and the Xbox One X. Mm Mm-hmm. And they just introduced the new budget option, which is the all-digital version of the Xbox One S, which uh, I have jokingly started to call the Xbox SAD because it's the Xbox One S AD. So there's a couple of downsides to that, to having a streaming-only console, uh, at least in the United States, right? So not everybody has solid internet for one. And if you don't have a solid internet connection, if you don't have a a place that offers some sort of a reliable hard line, uh, like cable or DSL or fiber, it's not a good idea uh, because you need a a fast, low latency connection for that type of gaming. Um, And and current FCC estimates that Roughly one, I believe it's one in four Americans have access to what they consider broadband internet, which is 25 megabits per second or faster. Right. Right. And there's a large, I don't know what the percentage is uh, of rural areas that don't have access to those types of internet services, but there's a pretty considerable percentage of of the geographic area of the continental United States that you can consider rural that don't have access to cable or DSL or fiber, you know, Um, and for their internet access, they're looking at some type of either cellular service or satellite or some other type of wire or wireless uh, service, which, can't come close to the types of speeds that you can get over a wired connection. I can speak to that from personal experience. Uh, My parents live in rural Tennessee, Mm -hmm. and they live in an area. uh, They live literally one mile outside the area for the local cable company. Okay. Uh, They live on a farm near a small town, Mm -hmm. and... So the only options they have for for internet are basically uh, cellular through Verizon or AT and T, or what they currently have is they have satellite internet through HughesNet. Okay, and HughesNet is very expensive. Yes, and they get fifteen megabytes per second up and 1.5 megabytes per second down with a data cap every month of 50 gigabytes. Yeah, that's ridiculous. And it's high latency. Yes. uh, I remember back in the day when I, when I was still living with them and they had it, uh, trying to play an MMO was always a dicey thing because you had ping of roughly 1500 milliseconds. Right. And that's, I want to say that's probably comparable to uh, dial up. Yes. So when you've got large a large percentage of use cases like that, you shouldn't consider even looking at a streaming console. People are still going to buy it, and they'll be mad because it doesn't perform well. But on the other side of it, say you live in a market that does offer a good solid wired connection, uh, it's still not going to give you the same level of performance as a local device currently. We just don't have the infrastructure for it. Um, You're not going to get the same gaming experience with something that requires uh, good reaction time and high FPS. Uh, There are types of games out there that will work very well over it, and there are games that gamers that just won't care, you know. But if you have if you have a shooter, uh, say like a Doom clone or something, and you've got a high refresh rate TV, you don't want to have a streaming console. 
you right, have because, something that's local. Because, I mean, even if we're talking about Google Stadia, which claims to have uh, latencies below 100 milliseconds. Yeah. 100 milliseconds when you're playing a Twitch shooter is eternity. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you can feel the lag. There is lag that's introduced between your input device. So that'll be right a controller. So mm -hmm. you're gonna have you're gonna have lag from when you do an action on the controller versus what you see on the screen. So you know, even if it is just that 100 milliseconds, that tenth of a second, yeah, that's enough for you to be able to perceive it, especially when. If you're dealing with a high refresh rate monitor, say even even 120 hertz, mm -hmm. that's roughly what 16.67 uh, milliseconds, something like that. Between each frame, second. yeah, yeah, yeah. So at that point, 100 milliseconds delay, that's five frames. Yep. And that, that could mean the difference between life or death on your online first-person shooter. Yeah. So, yeah, in that regard. But there's lots of other games where it won't even matter, right? Like RTSs, sports games. A lot of MMOs. Racing games. Even, I mean, there's lots of games where that won't really matter. Or gamers will just get accustomed to the latency and just figure, eh, you know, whatever. Yeah, there, there are people who uh, I used to game with who got so used to playing with lag that they actually got worse when they started to play on a high-speed connection. <laughs> and they had to completely relearn how to play because they didn't have to anticipate the latency anymore. Yeah, and they're uh, back in the day... Uh, there used to be games where you could cheat because of the latency. Um, you could introduce certain lead times, or there's there's different ways of popping around the map because you could use the latency to your advantage. So mm -hmm. now uh, game programming has come a long way since then, and uh, those type that type of latency, if expected you know, is accounted for right there when, when they're designing a game. But coming back to this article, uh, I didn't mean to segue too much, but coming back to this article, there are some mistakes in here. So okay. um, it does mention that, that AMD unveiled the 3600G at CES or is using, yeah, and I don't, yeah, and it wasn't unveiled at CES. What they did show was uh, they did release Epic, I want to say. They also showed a side-by-side -side comparison between uh, Intel's current mainstream performance king uh, in Cinebench um, with the upcoming Ryzen 3000 as well as Radeon 7. So they did release a video part. Uh, high performance video card. However, they didn't release any of the Ryzen 3000s. Right. Um, the uh, the engineering sample they showed at CES was an eight core, sixteen thread part, much like what Sony is claiming is going to go into the PS5. Mm -hmm. But it was never given an official badge of being a 3600G. That's speculation based on some rumors and some leaks. Yes. And Which, I mean, they those look do those do look convincing, and there is other leaked information that kind of backs that up. But right, we're and I know we'll get it to it in, in another article here. But it's looking like Ryzen three thousand based APUs are going to be uh, of a different architecture, more of current tech versus Navi. Right, just like with the current Ryzen 2000 APUs that use Zen cores instead of Zen Plus cores, yeah. uh, it's looking like the Ryzen 3000 APUs will use Zen Plus cores instead of Zen 2 cores. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I know we'll get to that here in a minute, but uh, honestly, I don't know what else. I mean, the 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 title states, "What do the PS5 specs tell us about the future of PlayStation versus Xbox?" And the only thing I can really come away with is we'll have more of the same as we've seen with PS4 versus Xbox One, uh, potentially, and the fact that. Microsoft is looking to compete with Google's um, streaming console. Uh, beyond that, I don't see anything else really from this article to suggest what we could see as a preview uh, between Sony and Microsoft. So I'm kind of left wondering, well, what's going on? We probably won't see really anything until we get closer to release dates for both of the consoles. My guess. Yeah. There, there have been some claims that AMD is going to unveil more at CES about given that Sony is planning to show off the PS5 for the first time. At least that's the current rumor and speculation. Mm -hmm. Well, I say rumor and speculation, but it's mostly confirmed through a variety of sources. Uh, to the point where Tom's Hardware published an article about it today, one that I didn't include mostly for time's sake, but completely understand. <laughs> completely understand. So okay, but moving on. Speaking of Microsoft, though, Microsoft and Windows Ten, they just can't seem to quite get it right. <laughs> so this world. Windows 10 May 2019 update bug prevents the upgrade unless all SD card and USB devices are removed. Seriously? <laughs> are you fucking serious? Microsoft says it will fix the bug in a future roll-up release, but with a month to go before the Windows 10 May 2019 update, there should still be time to fix this. So, yeah, that means, okay, so I have to disconnect my mouse and keyboard and my headphones so that I can update my operating system. Yeah, uh, so this bug was detected by those in the Windows Insiders program. Okay. So because it hasn't reached official release status, the bug, uh, basically the workaround for the bug is remove all your SD cards and other USB storage. Thankfully, it's just storage. It's not uh, input devices. Oh, okay, good. Good. That makes me feel better. <laughs> but yeah, you if, you use, if you use a USB backup solution or you put SD cards into your system for like transferring photos and the like, mm -hmm. make sure you have them all removed before you do the update. Wow. Can you imagine if this bug... Uh, if the scope of this bug also encompassed media card readers, so oh, like goodness. all those laptops out there with with uh, integrated media card readers, can you imagine that? You're going to have to disconnect your media card reader to get the Windows update. <laughs> oh, but that's the thing. Here's the here's the beautiful thing: the error that people get when they try to do the update. Mm -hmm. and they have something connected that doesn't work, is this PC can't be upgraded to Windows 10. <laughs> Your PC has hardware that isn't ready for this version of Windows 10. That's hilarious. No action is needed. I've heard, even though you've already technically got Windows 10. Yes. That's silly. So, Microsoft, come on. You had you released the October 2018 update in February because you had <laughs> so many problems with it. I get you want to move to this rolling release model, but you're not doing well with it. Well, they've I mean, time and time again, there there's kind of these silly little edge case bugs that are out there. Uh, I mean, they need to maybe invest in QA. You know, some quality assurance, little love going on there, you know? Perhaps, but here's the thing. The reason the update won't go through is because something in the update causes drives to be, quote, inappropriately reassigned drive letters. Oh, nice. 
So you so you 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 download the update, you update your computer, and then you you roll the dice. What drive letter am I going to have tomorrow? Right. Basically, they're saying that it would show up as perhaps G before the update, and after the update, it would be relabeled as H or X <laughs> or who knows. That's hilarious. That's so, hilarious. That's why the May 2019 update was delayed from being the April 2019 update to the May 2019 update. <laughs> so, well, honestly, I mean, say what you will, at least it was found before it became a, an officially released update. Imagine the press true. they'd be getting, you know what I mean? Imagine the press they'd be getting at that point. <laughs> well, I mean, this is the same Microsoft that used unsuspecting users as beta testers without their permission. Yeah. So, I, yeah. I don't have a lot of sympathy, to be honest. <laughs> right on. I can I can appreciate that. Wow. That's funny. All right. So let's we'll we'll switch gears now to the AMD news. And there are a few pieces of AMD news this week. Uh, last week, we talked about that there was going to be some AMD 50th anniversary hardware. Well, we found out some new stuff about some of this hardware. Uh, we mentioned that there was going to be a 50th anniversary Ryzen 7 2700X, a 50th anniversary Radeon 7, and a 50th anniversary RX 590 from Sapphire. Well, it turns out that the 50th anniversary Ryzen 7 2700X, X, bleh, bleh, X, <laughs> uh, basically is going to feature Lisa Sue signature. So this comes from TechSpot. Yeah, right on the IHS, it looks like. Yep, it's going to have Dr. Lisa Sue's signature right on the in integrated heat spreader. Uh, here, I will share this photo from TechSpot, if you'll give me just a moment. There we go. So there is the photo. Uh, this comes from Video Card Z originally, but uh, TechSpot is showing the photo here of the box. Notice it's uh, instead of the orange and black scheme, it's been traded in for a gold and black one. Nice. And you have the signature of Dr. Lisa Su on the Ryzen 7 2700X. So spec-wise, this is going to be basically the same as the uh, standard Ryzen 7 2700X, except it's going to have the special AMD 50 logo that you see right here. Dr. Lisa Sue's signature, and will come packaged in this special black and gold retail box. So I got to I got to be honest, I really do like the packaging and the uh the uh, updated IHS design is pretty nice looking as well. Little bummed that they're not, that the leak, uh, well, most of the leaks I've seen um, don't really show any differences in the, the CPU specs. I was kind of hoping they'd have, uh, you know, bend variants that had slightly higher clock speeds because, um, for a while, there were rumors of a potential 2800. Right. I was kind of hoping they would have released some of that stock if, if it ever existed. But uh, honestly, at the end of the day, I mean, it, it's kind of cool that they do this kind of stuff. I kind of like this. This is kind of nice. Yeah. And I mean, I get it. Every company does something like this when an anniversary rolls around. You know, you had the 8086K from Intel, which was basically just a binned and overclocked 8700K. Mm -hmm. Now you've got this 50th anniversary Ryzen 7 2700X, which if I had to guess is probably a binned 2700X. I don't know if it'll perform any better, but we'll see. Well, I mean, they're they're basically still stouting the or stating that it's going to have the same base and boost, same TDP. So, uh, for at least from that perspective, it's not looking to be any different. It could be. Uh, I mean, it's not yet released, so anything can change. 
Indeed. But uh, that's supposed to be coming out on May the 1st, because that is the 50th birthday of AMD. Oh, nice. So next Wednesday. Indeed. Great. I'll be looking forward to reading about that. And so if you're not interested in a 50th anniversary 2700X, though, you might be a bit more interested in the upcoming 3000 series APUs. Uh, this comes from WCCF Tech, and it is a leak, so take it with a grain of salt. But these were specifications leaked for the Ryzen 5 3400G and the Ryzen 3 3200G. Okay. Uh, these are both 12 nanometer parts with Zen Plus based CPU dies. Uh, basically, this leak comes from uh, the Chip Hell forums. Uh, it's a Chinese electronics forum. Okay. Uh, it supposedly has the first picture of a Ryzen 3 3200G, along with uh, what appears to be a soldered heat spreader for these CPUs, or APUs. That's interesting. A interesting change compared to what uh, was with the 2000 series. Uh, some of you may remember the 2400G and the 2200G used thermal interface material and was not soldered. So it could, with some very delicate work, be delitted. Yeah. Yeah. Derbauer has a really good delitting tool out there for them. But those, but tech savvy people that have done it saw, uh, you know, better thermals, but didn't really see much as far as overclocking headroom. Right. So basically, uh, I will show the pictures here. So let me go ahead and share those. So these are the photos. Uh, you can see. It says AMD Ryzen 3 3200G. He, you can see he's got the razor blade there as he was working his way around to try and delit it. Nice. Unfortunately, in his attempt to do so, he wound up separating part of the chip. And it stuck to the integrated heat spreader. <laughs> and that's when he found out that it is, in fact, soldered. My bad. Oh, uh, nice. He's got a little handwritten table out. Yeah, he did take some notes of what he observed before he attempted his D-lid. Okay. So, some interesting things here. I'm assuming 75, 79, 75, 80, that is temperature in degrees Celsius. Most likely. Yeah. Notice, uh, the voltages are all at 1.38 volts. Okay. But in comparison, the 2200G was hitting 4 gigahertz. The 3200G was hitting 4.3 gigahertz okay and meanwhile 2400g was hitting 3.925 gigahertz whereas the 3400g was hitting 4.25 gigahertz so uh, this looks like a very believable data set and the reason i say that is because when you look at side by side overclocking comparisons between uh similarly spec Ryzen first gen parts versus Zen Plus parts, you're going to see the same clock speed differences. Uh, and actually, you can see that. So if you compare 1700X to 2700X, there's not a whole lot of difference in terms of overall clock speeds. Uh, just the 2700X seems to be higher by. Uh, I want to say by two or 300 megahertz. So, and that's roughly um, what we're seeing here. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I, that's why I say, I think this is a believable data set. I mean, in my own testing of the 2400 G, um, which I, is, in my mind, it's a fantastic little APU. Um, when I took away the bottlenecks of power and cooling, so what I mean by that is when I gave it an external power supply of 750 watts and put it 
and took off the stock heatsink and added a an AIO to it, uh, I was able to get up to a clock speed of right around 4.11 gigahertz. Uh, pretty stable, but it was consuming quite a bit of power. Um, I didn't really try to push it any farther than that. I probably could have, but then at that point, you're starting to get to where you're feeding a ton of volts through it, which can borderline on unsafe. But it's a it's it's an impressive little part. Speaking of, I did want to show a couple other things here as well. Uh, this is a translated version, or is a version of the table that has been translated mostly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you can see the differences as they compare the CPUs or APUs. I wouldn't believe the TDP data. Well, I think the TDP so, data in this case is, uh, that, it looks like there might be a bit of a copy-paste error, but... That looks like it's probably coming from the mobile variants. Possible. Or it could be just a bad read from the software. Sure. Uh, and then we have the carnage. <laughs> this is a great it's picture. Yeah, this is what happened when he attempted to delid the CPU. And this is how he found out it uses a soldered TIM. Surprise! So Good thing uh, he had some extra parts laying around. And notice, here is a Ryzen, a Ryzen 3 2200G for comparison up here. This is the 3200G that he, uh, well, wound up destroying. Uh, he did take the time to clear out all the uh, all the confidential information there, at least. Okay. So yeah, that was the unfortunate end of his thirty two hundred G. So uh, say what you will. I know that we've had leaks that state that we're going to be getting Navi graphics parts in these APUs, and potentially Ryzen or Zen 2, or Ryzen 3000 CPUs. Say what you will about that. Uh, I think this is potentially believable because if we look at mobile Ryzen 3000, it's also Zen Plus based and Vega based, uh, like the previous generation was for the mobile parts. So um, I, I like the move, though going to uh, a soldered um, interface material between the CPU and the, you know, the, the CPU package and the, or the APU package and the IHS. That'll be a welcome addition. Um, I am a little sad, though, that they're not really beefing it up any more than that. I mean, Zen Plus is going to get you some nice gains. You know, it with all of the latency performance and with all of the latency improvements on Zen Plus, it will feel a bit snappier. Um, the nice part is it will clock higher. Uh, however, I'm a little sad to see that they're not really improving much more than that, though. Well, more of an in incremental can, upgrade. What's on up? On one hand, I can understand perhaps why they didn't. And that's because since it is basically Zen Plus based, Mm -hmm. uh, basically, it could be that because they are Zen Plus based dies, that they're not able to utilize the same chiplet tech that they're using for the Zen 2 CPUs. And so they're having to kind of stick with what they did with the Zen Plus based Ryzen 2000 series. And I mean, there's a lot of ways we can approach this from, uh, either a speculation or an analysis perspective, right? I mean, we can look at this and, and uh, perhaps they've got lots of Zen Plus stock laying around, you know, or Vega stock or both. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it's still going to perform well, you know. Um, I imagine the prices might come down a bit, but 
versus what they launched the initial APUs at. But uh, I don't know. Kind of meh. Kind of kind of interesting. Yeah, I think uh, I'm not sure the the 3200G or the 3400G are going to be the interesting parts. I think it will be the Matisse based APUs that we see that come later. Yes. That will be the more interesting ones. Yes. Well, they will. And uh, in 2019, calling a quad core a Ryzen 5. Mm. Even if it is so, even if it does have simultaneous multi threading for eight threads. Right. And respectable clock speeds, too. Uh, even with that, it's. Yeah. Come on, AMD. Come on. Give us. Give us a six core, 12 thread. You know, okay, if you want to stick with Vega graphics, that's fine. It still has, it still offers decent performance, but give us at least a six core, 12 thread. <laughs> eh, well, they may not weird. be able, they may not be giving us a six core, 12 thread APU, but. Uh, this from post on Pharonix, which Pharonix, remember, is a Linux-focused uh, hardware testing site. But Pharonix says that it looks like AMD is about to post the open-source Radeon drivers for Navi. Okay, that's kind of cool. Uh, they noticed that the AMD GPU LLVM backend began to see commits of what is being referred to in the code as GFX 1010. 1010. Where is that? GFX 1010 in Linux speak is Navi based GPUs. Interesting. Okay. And so basically these are the target definitions for that basically lay the groundwork for the open source drivers in Linux. So that means the release of Navi is nigh. It is coming soon. Yes. The fact that the drivers are being committed to the Linux kernel means that we can expect Navi code very soon. Now, Which means parts will be released right after that. Cool, man. I'm getting excited. So, I'm getting very excited about this. Yeah, basically what they're saying is uh, they're estimating this is probably going to come out post Linux kernel 5.2 okay. with the uh, Ubuntu 19.04 just came out. Mm -hmm. It is sporting the Linux kernel 5.0. Linux kernel 5.1 is expected to be out in just a couple of weeks. 5.2 is expected in roughly July. Okay. And they expect the next stable kernel will be 5.3 in September. And what? Linux 5.3 is at least what should be in Ubuntu 19.10. And Fedora 31. So are they... So it's been a while since I've been in the Ubuntu corners, but is the 04 still the LTS? And then the, the 10 is more of the non-LTS? Uh... Technically, yes, but okay. only in even-numbered years. Um, the LTS is going to be in even-numbered years. 16.04 oh. was an LTS. 18.04 was an LTS. 20.04 will be an LTS. If they follow that convention. Right. Uh, assuming they follow that convention going forward, they have up to this point. Uh, the only one that wasn't a .04 LTS mm -hmm. was way back in 2006 with 6.06 .06 Dapper Drake which was an LTS. Listen to you, Mr. Ubuntu Encyclopedia. The current 19.04 is another D release, only this time it is Disco Dingo. Disco Dingo. Uh, it no. is a short-term release that only is going to be uh, supported for a nine-month cycle, but that's true of all the interim releases between okay. the LTSs. You know, you got to hand it to Ubuntu. They've always had the code names down, man. 
Oh yeah. Always had code names. Yeah, the fact that uh, eighteen point oh four, which was an LTS, was Bionic Beaver. <laughs> what was that one that they had the narwhal or whatever that thing was? Oh, oh was yes, that? Natty Narwhal. That yeah, was Natty Narwhal. Yep, that was eleven point oh four. Way that's been way back in the day, but I remember eleven point oh four was controversial. Because it's when they introduced the Unity desktop, and mm -hmm. it made a lot of people mad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Me included. I tried Unity, man. Oh my gosh, I really tried to like it. I just couldn't. That's what ultimately turned me to Mint. Yeah, uh, the Unity desktop was very controversial, but there were a lot of people who loved it, and there were a lot of people who hated it. Well, at least they were trying stuff, you know. And. You know, when they went back to GNOME with, uh, gosh, what was that, 16.04? That sounds about right. When, when they went back to GNOME with 16.04, uh, that's when I started using, uh, I, I, although admittedly, I generally don't use Base Ubuntu that much anymore. Uh, most of my systems are either running Linux Mint, uh, Ubuntu Mate with the Mate desktop, Mm -hmm. Or uh, sometimes I will run a more specialized OS. Like uh, I've been, I've been experimenting with Pop OS, and also with Manjaro because uh, I have in the past successfully installed Arch Linux from scratch, but well. I'm not enough of a masochist to make myself do it again. <laughs> I can't blame you for that one. I've gotten, I don't know. I've gotten lazy in my old age. I just. That's why I've been exploring Manjaro because it does yeah. give you access to all those wonderful Arch resources in the AUR, or the Arch user repositories. But it's more stable. But, well, you just don't have to do all the silly maintenance stuff you have to do with Arch. Mm. Arch gives you ultimate control. The problem with that ultimate control is that you make one slip up and you bork the whole install. Yeah, so then you're left reinstalling. Manjaro handles all the little details so that you don't have to. But it still gives you access to all the best parts of Arch. Yeah, call me call me lazy, but if I'm gonna if I'm making the switch to to Linux, I'll just throw mint on something and Call it a day. I mean, it's extremely rare that I have a Mint install go bad, regardless of the desktop I pick. You know what I mean? Yeah. Usually most... Go ahead. I was going to say, generally, the only time I've had a Mint install go bad is when I've installed a bad PPA. Ah. Uh, I have found one... One... Um, really inexpensive... So I've got uh, someone in my family that I support from a computing perspective um, has a small little Acer. I don't even know if you call it a netbook, really, but it's it's a small, inexpensive mobile device, right? That's kind of a laptop light. Uh, but the most recent version of Mint doesn't like it. As soon as you up, as soon as you run through one or two updates for it, it totally borks the install, and I've got to reinstall. So I just have them on a pre prior version of Mint, and it works fine. Yeah, sometimes you have to do that. Um, that's part of the reason I've been sticking back on Mint eighteen point three. Okay. Uh, because it is based on eighteen point zero four, which is the LTS kernel, mm -hmm. and so you definitely have a little bit better stability. Don't get me wrong, yeah, Mint 19 is mm -hmm. Mint 19 is solid, but 19.1 it had some quirks. Yeah, I just prefer something stable. No uh, issues. That's part of the reason I've stayed back on 18.03 so far. Yeah, that's what so, we had to revert to. If I remember right, it was 18.03. All right. 
Here we go. Yeah, I've been waiting for this. Oh, yeah. So, to the NVIDIA news. Yeah. Sadly, the NVIDIA news this week is kind of a big pile of meh. That's and <laughs> that's because the big release from NVIDIA, or well, <laughs> the release, to call it a big release is kind of a, a misnomer is the GeForce GTX 1650. And this thing was shrouded in controversy before it even released because NVIDIA refused to give the tech press an early press driver and instead made them wait till the public driver became available like everybody else. <laughs> and so none of the tech press was able to get a day one review done until after the public driver went up, yeah. at which point... They had to download and do their benchmarks basically in a 12-hour period. Right. And uh, this did not sit well with a lot of the tech press. Uh, Gamers Nexus put out a rather scathing video about it, and so did TechSpot, or Hardware Unboxed, which yep. is uh, the YouTube wing of TechSpot. And that's part of the reason why I included TechSpot's review here, because, well... Steve, Steve does not pull any punches about the GTX 1650. Nah, and, and rightfully so. He's not maliciously attacking it, but he's backing up his, his viewpoint with very solid data. I mean, even in the limited time he had available to him to benchmark the GPU, mm -hmm. he benchmarked it in a dozen games, which is no small feat. That man is a benchmark machine, and I know he claims that he needs sleep, but sometimes I do swear he is a robot. Yeah, I completely agree with that one. That guy can turn out a review in no time flat. And so, first, the basics. The GeForce GTX 1650, which we've been talking about for a while, all the specs that we saw ahead of time pretty much were confirmed. It does. It is a Turing-based GPU that uses the TU-117 die, which is basically a cut-down version of the die that is on the GTX 1660 Ti and 1660 Vanilla. It packs 896 CUDA cores. It uh, has 32 ROPs, has a core clock of 1485 megahertz with a boost clock of 1665, which it will routinely boost past. Yeah. It has a memory clock of 8,000 mega transfers per second, a 128-bit memory bus for a memory bandwidth of 128 gigabytes per second, and has 4 gigabytes of GDDR5 VRAM with a total TDP of 75 watts for the base model, although many models are including an additional 6-pin connector to up the TDP which is configurable to 90 watts. Yeah. So the problem is with that part, if you get the 75 watt version, there is little to no overclocking headroom on the GPU. And what people are routinely seeing boost speeds of is right around 1700 to 1750 megahertz on the 75 watt TDP parts. Correct. Where there is room is with overclocking the memory, where you can get some decent gains. So the 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 problem with the card is that it's very memory starved with 128 bit memory bus, right? So over uh, with with uh, the type of GDDR5 that they are using. Um, they have some decent clock speed room there. So while you are hitting a hard limit, you know, because of the card's TDP at 75 watts, at the GPU, um, in terms of overclocking or, or, or configuring there, uh, at least you can do some tweaking of the memory of several hundred megahertz. And that gives you, I want to say right around probably a 5% percent performance increase um somewhere between five and eight percent i think from what i've seen on the title generally 
Yeah. Uh, but then to, to overclock it at least a bit, you have to get one of those, one of those parts that has the, uh, external, you know, power cable or that six pin adapter, you know, uh, but even then you're only seeing boost speeds up to gosh, what was it? 1.8 gigahertz somewhere in there, maybe 1.9. I, I want to say they were just seeing, uh, probably a conservative figure of, of 18 or of 1.835 gigahertz routinely. Uh, and honestly, that doesn't give you much. I mean, you've got some overclocking headroom there moving 15 watts up to 90 watts, but it's not a lot. Uh, and, the, and at the end of the day, the performance is maybe up to 8%, depending on the title. So, uh, and then you're paying $30 more for those parts, typically, 20 to $30 more. Yeah, and that that's the thing that ultimately, I think, hurts the GTX 1650 more than anything. And that is that its competition is not the 1050 Ti. Right. Because the 1050 Ti, although it routinely beats it, the 1050 Ti is currently more expensive and offers less performance than the real competition here, which is the 4 gigabyte RX 570. And this is the thing that has come up again and again and again with reviews of the 1650. And that is that you can get the RX 570 4 gigabyte model for usually between $20 to $30 less than GTX 1650. And on average, it performs 15 to 20% better. Yeah. And I mean, say what you will, RX 570 TDP is between 120 watts and 150 watts. I mean, I don't have the exact the exact number here. And yes, it is technically one and a half to two times more power consumption. But honestly, honestly, in a graphics card, 150 watt TDP, it's not bad at all. Um, and there's going to be legions of NVIDIA fans that say this this is the only card or this is the best performing card for 75 watts you know basically plug into your to your computer well that's a redonkulous use case that's the only use case where the 1650 makes sense is if you don't want to upgrade your power supply you just simply want to have the best performing 75 watt part to slap into your computer well honestly you can buy you can buy a refurbed hp or a dell that's ivy bridge i5 you know like a full-fledged refurbished system with a warranty for around 200 bucks right spend 35 to 40 dollars on a nice brand new um 80 something rated power supply a 500 watt at least and then one hundred and thirty dollars on an RX five seventy. What are you out? Four hundred bucks or less, and you've got a decent ten eighty p gaming machine. Boom! You're welcome. Yeah, pretty much. And that's you know, right now that's basically exactly what I'm doing. With I have a Dell Optiplex thirty twenty. Mm-hmm. I picked up with no hard drive, but it had eight gigs of RAM and a Core i five forty five ninety. I picked up that. For 80 bucks. Yep. Because it had no hard drive. I picked up a 500 gigabyte hard drive for 10 bucks. I got a 500 watt EVGA 80 plus bronze power supply for 35 bucks. Yep. I'm looking at them right now. I'm looking at them right now. Seriously. If, If you go to Newegg, you can filter by brand new power supplies. I'm looking right now at a Cougar VTE series, 500 watt, 80 plus bronze for $34.99. Yep. Free shipping. Pretty much. That's a that's a that's a pretty decent power supply. Now I will say the one thing you might run into 
with a with a pre-built like that, and this is what I ran into. Dell uses a proprietary power connector for their power supplies. So I had to buy a converter off eBay for five bucks. <laughs> oh no, five dollars. Oh so, no, you buy a better performing part for less and have to have to buy a power supply? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I had to buy a five I had to buy a, a 24 pin ATX to eight pin Dell power supply converter for five bucks the only the only thing that was bad about that is i had to wait about three weeks to get it shipped from china but ah uh, but still but still I, I was able to get that uh we are going to feature a deal later on in this show that features a gigabyte rx 570 for 120 bucks mm. so if i pick that up to put in this system I actually have a different GPU I'm going to put in there, but if I put that in that system, I would be out literally 350 bucks and have a very solid 1080p, high 1080p gaming machine. So to kind of recap what we've stated here, at its current price range from basically $150 to $180, the GTX 1650 makes zero sense. The use case for I want the best performing part at 75 watts is extremely bad and very slim. Um, there's lots of people out there that probably want that, but, but it's extremely ridiculous. It is niche. It yes. is very niche. It's extremely niche. It's about as niche as, as open loop water cooling is, you know? Uh, it's beyond ridiculous, uh, especially when you're looking at having a part that's 20% faster on average and has a price range of $129 to $179 at the top end. And that top end part has a $20 mail-in rebate. And yes, yep. I'm talking about the RX 570. That is beyond in a way... I've never seen this before, Ned. I've never seen this before, where there's a competing part that is 20% faster on average, sometimes better than that, depending on the game title, that is cheaper and has the same top-end price range. It's just simply the better, the better deal, the better option. The 1650 does not make sense at all at its current price point. Uh, I was taking a look at the specs, or I was taking a look at the results from TechSpot here. I'll share this for our audience. Okay. They found that the RX 574 gig was 10% slower on, or excuse me, the 1650 was 10% slower on average at 1080p, but notice what the differences are in the titles they tested. They yeah. tested dozen games two of those games fortnite and rainbow six siege are known to be very lenient toward nvidia type very nvidia supported titles mm -hmm. uh rainbow six siege not as much for pascal cards but for turing the uh the way the engine works for some of the rendering turing just eats it up mm -hmm. And so Rainbow Six Siege, the 1650 is 14% faster, and it is 4% faster in Fortnite. But notice in the other 10 titles, the margins for the RX 570 are a lot bigger, in particular for the new World War Z, Resident Evil 2, The Division 2, Forza Horizon 4, and Far Cry New Dawn. It's between 18 and 28% faster the RX 570 and the 1650. Well, to add some context to World War Z, though, uh, the four the four to five hundred dollar Vega 64 right now beats the uh, 2080 T the thirteen hundred dollar 2080 Ti in that title. <laughs> well, and to be fair, World War Z is an AMD sponsored title, so we'd expect to see that kind of performance difference. Likewise, Fortnite and Rainbow Six Siege are more NVIDIA geared, and so we'd expect to see the NVIDIA part do better. Mm -hmm. 
it's all the ones in the middle there, which you have several AMD titles, several NVIDIA titles, like Metro Exodus in particular here. Metro Exodus is an NVIDIA title, but the RX 570 is beating the 1650 in it. Yeah. But to also put this in perspective, an RX 570, this is a stock RX 574 gig against the stock GeForce GTX 1650. And the fact that you can get that 570 $30 cheaper than the 1650. So that's... That should also be accounted for here. Uh, and just to add some context. That's so cost per the frame. conclusion that Steve reaches here. Notice, cost per frame, RX 570. Each frame that you get from their test suite at 1080p for a 12-game average is $1.94 per frame. Okay. In contrast, the 1650 is two dollars and fifty four cents per frame and the only nvidia card that comes close to the rx 570 in price per frame is the 1660 which i know we've talked about this uh, a little bit but the 1660 actually is okay value that's probably the only card in NVIDIA's current Turing stack, which is okay value. I mean, you can kind of make a case for 1660 Ti, but the 1660 is like the only the only one I would recommend to somebody. You know what's even sillier than this? So if you look at the GTX 1650 at its top end, its top end currently on Newegg is $180, basically. You spend 10 bucks more, you get the RX 580. <sighs> the only price point where 1650 makes sense is 100 bucks. So yeah, basically the 1650 does not make a whole lot of sense at its current price point. At $120, it would be far more interesting. Yeah. And it's like I have said before about multiple products before. I said it about the RX 590, which mm -hmm. we've seen its price go down significantly. I've said it about a number of NVIDIA products before. There are no bad products, just bad prices. Yep, and that's exactly true with the GTX 1650. It's ridiculously bad at its current price point. I, and if I don't I, care what's that. At $25 less, it would be an interesting card. Yep. I'm going to go out and say it. Uh, I feel very strongly about this, and um, I don't really... Now, I, I tend to favor AMD lately because they offer better value, but that's where the majority of my buying recommendations for people go, is what offers the best value for your use case. And I'm going to come right out and say it. If you buy 1650, you're dumb. I don't care. That's just that's the way I feel about it. So it's 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 stupid. It's Wait, literally dumb. Jason has spoken. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not going to apologize for my feelings. <laughs> well, the hit just won't stop coming for the GTX 1650. Good. Because Reddit found that NVIDIA swapped the NVENC encoder on the 1650. It is not the Turing NVENC encoder. It is the Volta NVENC encoder, which, of course, is older and less efficient. I wonder why why they did that. If it was just a basic mistake or... Well, uh, we've talked about in the past, NVENC is a proprietary encoder that is included on NVIDIA GPUs mm -hmm. that allows them to execute certain video encoding workloads. Basically, the idea being to offload tasks from your CPU to the graphics card to free up resources. Mainly, I mean, most popularly used in streaming. So, like right. Twitch. Yeah. In particular, with OBS, Wirecast, Bandicam, Handbrake, uh, and also for even NVIDIA's own Shadow Play. Mm -hmm. And so, starting way back in Kepler, uh, 
I remember uh, the first card I got to experience it with was the GTX 770. Yep. Although That's when it was first introduced. Uh, the NVENC encoder works with any card that is the GTX 650 or higher. Basically, uh, the GTX 1650, for some reason, gets the Volta encoder instead yes. of the current Turing encoder. That's so weird because the Turing encoder is, I mean... That's the first time it's it's actually competitive with CPU rendering. It's actually really good. The Turing the Turing based one is really good. I don't know about Volta. And the thing that's really puzzling is that the TU one one six based Turing GPU, <laughs> the sixteen sixty 1660 and the sixteen sixty Ti, both use Turing's NVENC encoder. Mm -hmm. So why when they decided to downsize the 1650 they swap back to Volta's encoder which is only slightly faster than Pascal's and is about 15% less efficient than Turing makes very little sense and so I mean obviously hmm. GTX 1650 you're not looking to do high end gaming with that fine I get it but if someone were to, in Jason's words, be dumb and buy this <laughs> for their setup, and they yeah. want to stream for the first time, you know, like I have a little 13-year-old cousin who loves to play Fortnite. If he wanted to, if he got this and decided he wanted to stream for the first time, I'd hate to see him have reduced stream performance because he went with the 1650 over any of the other Turing cards. Mm -hmm. It's just... NVIDIA, I, I don't know... I don't know what intoxicants you were under when you decided to launch the 1650 this way, but please stop and get some help. I'm guessing probably a nice little cocktail of, uh, you know, Percocet, Vicodin, maybe a little morphine, you know? Uh, I don't know about that, but uh, I think they definitely may have been... Uh, Smoking some of their own hubris. <laughs> That's putting it lightly. So, at the end of the day, the only thing I can recommend for somebody looking for a mainstream card, if you're only going to stick with NVIDIA, is 1660. Just pony up for the 1660. Yes, your wallet's going to take the hit, but at $220, it's not that much more. Yeah, wait, a, wait another month or two and... Save up your pennies, you know, with whatever your your budget is for, for saving back for computer upgrades and just get a 1660. Trust me, you're going to be a lot, a lot happier by, by doing that. Oh, yeah. The 1660 performs roughly the same as a stock 1070. So, yeah. Talking entry level 1440p gaming at that point. Yeah. 1080p, everything, everything maxed out. In today's games. And if you want to try streaming, you've got that fantastic Turing based NVNC encoder. And, exactly. you know, I mean, with that thing, honestly, if to put it in perspective, so the CPU encoder is still slightly better. The software based encoder is slightly technically better, but you could take a Core i3 with a 1660 and stream at close to the same stream quality as a Ryzen 5 2600 on the, on the software encoder. So that's saying something. Exactly. Honestly. Yeah. Of course, we knew that if there's a 1650 and it's supposed to be the successor to the 1050, there had to be a 1650 Ti on the way. And from WCCF Tech, we have some confirmation of that. Uh, in particular, Asus has listed some custom models that are supposed to, based on some filings with the ECC, bring performance of the Radeon RX 580 to a 75-watt TDP. To which I say, I will believe it when I see it. 
Exactly. I mean, uh, that that's really hard to to swallow. I mean, when you're looking at at current sixteen fifty performance being so hard locked at seventy five watts, that's basically screaming that at seventy five watts, the base sixteen fifty has no more headroom. So how are you going to take a card that is based on the same GPU, most likely? <clears throat> so how, how are you going to take the same GPU and give it 30% more performance with the same TDP? That's impossible. Even if you bend. Even if you bend. There's no way. You, you, I mean... Even if you unlocked some additional CUDA cores, like the best you could hope for is ten percent, uh, a ten percent performance uplift. I mean, you've got to have a balance somewhere, you know, of power yeah. consumption versus performance. Given that the current specs that are being floated for the sixteen fifty Ti feature a thousand twenty four CUDA cores, which is only what. 192 more CUDA cores? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, so with Turing, there is a nice IPC gain over Pascal, right? So 1,024 CUDA cores probably is somewhere slightly north of 1066 gig performance, I'm, I'm assuming. And that, that part had 1,280 Pascal-based CUDA cores. So... I mean, I can believe the fact that they could be right around 580 performance with the 1650 Ti. I could believe that part. I don't believe the 75 watt TDP at all. That would be closer to 90 watts, I'm guessing. 90 to 120 watts, somewhere in there. I would tend to agree. Um, my guess is that it's... I would guess that one of the earlier figures, that it's probably going to be closer to... 1280 CUDA cores, given that, given what we know uh, was disabled on the 1650 to make the T117 the cut down version that the 1650 uses, uh, technically fully enabled, it should have 1280. Well, that would make it, that would put it on par with the 1660, right? Well, the sixteen sixty technically has one thousand four hundred and eight. Oh, okay. My bad. I see corrected. So Okay. It would definitely make the gap smaller between the two. But well, if I mean if sixteen fifty TI has twelve hundred and eighty Turing based CUDA cores, that would make it actually more performant, potentially than the RX 580. The only thing that the RX 580 would have over it would be memory bandwidth. And that's the thing, is we saw with the 1650 in the reviews that it was memory bandwidth limited more than anything. Yeah. The fact that it was limited by 128-bit bus and limited to 128 gigabytes per mm -hmm. second is the thing that really hamstrung the performance. So to put that in perspective... DDR4-3200 in a dual rank or dual channel mode gives you right around 54, 50 to 54 gigabytes per second memory bandwidth. And yes, that's about twice the memory bandwidth, but... But uh, GPUs really need that memory bandwidth, so... Wow. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean it's evident when you overclock the the sixteen fifty, when you overclock the RAM on it, how much extra performance you do get, and you leave the base clock the same. Yeah, pretty much. I think I think the big limiter for the sixteen fifty Ti is going to be memory bandwidth, just like it is with the sixteen fifty. And the fact that it is stuck on a four gigabyte memory buffer. Now, that's <laughs> not a bad, that's not going to be a bad thing immediately. 
I think it'll be just fine at 1080p, even for modern games, mm -hmm. for at least a couple of years. Yeah. What I worry about is in a year or two, when the games start requiring more than four gigabytes at 1080p, because there's already games that do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Resident yeah. Evil 2, the remake. Yeah, uh, typically games that are really high AAA, high end AAA games. Metro Exodus, mm -hmm. Battlefield Five. It's very easy to get above four gigabytes of of texture memory. I mean, uh, I'll admit, I even thought it was a mistake for the sixteen sixty and the sixteen sixty Ti to be at six gigabytes. I'd agree with that, but I don't know. I mean, that's more for the cards that they're technically replacing in performance versus in the Pascal line, right? So 1070 had 8 gigs, 1070 Ti, 8 gigs, right? 1080 had 8 gigs. So I just don't see why in 2019 you release a card with that performance level being really good with only 6 gigs of RAM. So I don't know. Why not just give it eight? We may never know. Eh, whatevs. <laughs> All right. So that brings us around to Intel. And Intel, a few interesting stories this week. The first, Intel this week unveiled their full desktop Coffee Lake Refresh lineup. Yes, you heard that correctly. <laughs> Coffee Lake Refresh. Does anyone else remember the last time we had a refresh lineup? I don't remember when we had a refresh. I mean, technically, you could you could say uh, the last two were refreshes. You know, well, the seventh or the eighth or I forget what they're on now. The eighth gen, you could say, was a refresh. Well, the last time we had an official architecture refresh for a given code name was Haswell with Haswell and then the Haswell Refresh, which was codenamed Devil's Canyon. And I remember the Haswell Refresh well. Uh, I had a Pentium G3258, and that was an interesting, fun little CPU for its time. Mm -hmm. Haswell was a very good architecture. Uh, in fact, the Optiplex that I'm using for that budget build uh, it has an i5-4590, which is Haswell-based and is still a good CPU to this day. Mm -hmm. But remember, the whole reason we had the Haswell refresh is because Intel was having problems with 14 nanometer. <laughs> remember, Haswell was the last of the 22 nanometer. Yep. Are you talking Devil's Canyon refresh? Yeah. Ah, uh, Okay. So, remember, Broadwell was supposed to be the first 14 nanometer CPU, but Broadwell was never released en masse to the market. Yes, there were a few Broadwell CPUs. Uh, some of you may remember the 5545C and the 5575C, or the 5775C, mm -hmm. which were both Broadwell. And they were technically the first 14 nanometer CPUs from Intel. But the first mass production 14 nanometer CPUs, of course, wound up being Skylake. And we've been kind of stuck at 14 nanometers ever since, at least for Intel. And it looks like we're going to continue being stuck at 14 nanometer, this time 14 nanometer plus plus, for the Coffee Lake refresh. Which, honestly, until. Ryzen 3 comes out, or Ryzen 3000, until Ryzen 3000 comes out, it's still a very competitive node for them. I mean, these are good products. The problem is they're just too expensive. Yeah. Uh, most of these are, they basically look identical to what we've seen before. Uh, most of the new Coffee Lake Refresh processors are not likely to be ones that enthusiasts are going to look at in the first place. Uh, in particular, Tom's hardware here notes the Core i9-9900, which is a non-K part with a 3.1 gigahertz base and a 5 gigahertz boost. 
It is an eight core 16 thread CPU, but it is a 65 watt TDP versus the 95 watt for the K and KF variants. So, I mean, this, I mean, I'm looking at these. So all of the bold ones are the new ones, right? But this doesn't look like a refresh to me. This just looks like they're filling out the rest of the product stack. That's not a refresh. I don't know. Is it? I mean, they're just filling it out with their with the rest of the products, right? So, I mean, I would tend to agree with you, but with that said, all of these new CPUs do fill out the product stack, but they do use a. It's my understanding they're called Coffee Lake Refresh because they use a new stepping. Okay. They're still the same base architecture of Coffee Lake. That's a technicality, dude. Uh, I know. I'm just telling you Intel's reasoning. Okay. <laughs> and the 9900 is more expensive than the 9700K. What's going on there? That's interesting. Because Intel marketing. Right. Oh, we give you hyperthreading. Me. Never mind that every i7 before has had hyper-threading. Just <laughs> immediately ignore that fact. <laughs> Never mind the fact I snorted. <laughs> Never mind the fact. Never mind the fact that you're going down in terms of thread processing from, from the 8th gen i7 to the 9th gen i7. We're just giving you eight real physical cores. Okay. Rather than six. Okay. So, yeah, um, not a terribly exciting refresh, in my opinion, but, hey, they're filling out their product stack, and that's good, at least. Uh, something a little more exciting for Intel, and they need all the excitement they can get at the moment, and we'll talk about why in here a little bit. <laughs> okay. Uh, this was a feature article from Tom's Hardware yet again. Uh, apparently... There was an overclocking attempt using a Asus ROG Dominus Extreme motherboard and liquid nitrogen that cranked the Intel Xeon W3175X, the 28-core, 56-thread monster workstation CPU. Oh, yeah. All the way up to 5.7 gigahertz. Yeah. So hey, can you share the can you share the pick? Sure. With the pot. This thing looks wicked, man. It's got blue flame coming out of the pot. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, so here's the photo in question. You'll notice they are pumping in the liquid nitrogen. It's on fire. That reminds me of the dragon on Game of Thrones, dude. The zombie one? Yep. With the blue flame? <laughs> it's the Night King's it's the Night King Xeon is what it is. Sorry. So they ran into a number of problems throughout their overclocking attempts. But uh, the reason for the funky photos is because these photos were taken uh, using a phone, so they're having to do some filter and fill oh, in. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. But here's a photo of the entire setup. Wow. That's a wicked looking test bench, man. That is awesome. And the results they achieved. Uh, the the over overclocker who did this and who wrote this article, his name is Splave. Or that's the tag he goes by. Uh, you can see they were using an RX 580 for their GPU in this attempt because, you know, they weren't really concerned about GPU performance. Mm -hmm. And they did achieve a overall score in Time Spy Extreme of 16,759, which is the highest CPU score in... Time, Pi, Time Spy Extreme as the date of this broadcast. 
So rip gamers nexus, basically. Basically. <laughs> that is crazy. 5.7 gigahertz. Indeed. 5.7 wow. gigahertz on a 28 core 56 threaded monster. That's crazy. I wonder what kind of wattage that they were looking at at load. Can you imagine what that thing was running? I'm guessing maybe a thousand watts, man. Can you imagine that? No doubt. Uh, they did also achieve a world record W prime 1024 ranking of 16 seconds, 528 milliseconds. Beating okay. Previous record of 16 seconds, 583 milliseconds by uh, just under 55 milliseconds. Oh, so I'm looking at the article and they're stating that the IHS was not flat. Yeah, they had to uh, they had to make some compensations for the fact that the IHS was not perfectly flat. It takes ten dollars of thermal grizzly cryonaut to coat the, the heat spreader. My gosh. Yep. So to put that in perspective, I bought this to use on my own parts. So I've got a 2700 x and a Vega. Uh, and I still have over 80% of this. And I've used it twice on my 2700 x and once on my Vega 56. And this is amazing stuff. It's well worth the money. And it's not a whole lot anyway. But the fact that this was completely used on that IHS when I've already used, used it on the 2700X, which is kind of a decent size IHS anyway, and a big GPU, and I still have a ton of it left over. That's saying something, man. Yep. That's crazy. Indeed, it that is. It's crazy. All right. Unfortunately, not all the news is good for Intel. Uh, this is this was published today, April the 25th, as we're recording this. Uh, Intel stock plummets, according to Market Watch, on disappointing earnings outlook as new CEO describes a more cautious trend. However, new permanent CEO Bob Swan remains confident that demand will improve in the second half of the year. Well, I mean, I'm sure it's down. They've they've not been doing well in some markets, but they've got such market dominance in so many of the, the markets that they do well in. It would take years, years and years to, to remove that branding. So uh, I don't think this is anything to really worry about, honestly. Well, uh, Intel shares did drop 9% okay. in trading. Uh, as the outlook fell well below estimates from Wall Street, uh, Intel reported adjusted earnings of $0.89 cents a share on $15.6 billion in revenue for the second quarter. This is below the $1.01 a share on revenue of $16.86 billion that had been forecast by Wall Street analysts. Hmm. And so... Intel, uh, this is Bob Swan speaking, our conversations with customers and partners across our PC and data-centric businesses over the last couple months have made several trends clear. The decline in memory pricing has intensified. The data center inventory and capacity digestion issues that we described in January are more pronounced than we expected. And China headwinds have increased, leading to a more cautious IT spending environment. And yet those same customer conversations reinforce our confidence Demand will improve in the second half of this year. As long as they can keep up with it. I mean, that's been a, that's been a major challenge for them is meeting demand uh, in several of their of their markets. I mean, um, 
several major OEMs are having to shift to uh, competing products just to fill demand. And they're doing surprisingly well by doing that. Not to mention the Qualcomm slash a, uh, Apple, you know, 5G radio debacle. Yep. So, uh, I mean, honestly, long term, it's not going to be a problem, I don't think, for them. But it is interesting nonetheless. And, of course, the, the bad news keeps coming for Intel. Now, this is a leak, so take it for what it is. Uh, this is from WCCF Tech. The Intel CPU 2018 through 2021 roadmap leaks out. Uh, up to 10 core Comet Lake S desktop CPUs expected in 2020, and 14 nanometer Rocket Lace Rocket Lake S in 2021, but no 10 nanometer LGA parts till 2022. I don't know if I believe this. This. This screams to me like it's, uh, oh, what's the word? This screams to me like like a deflection, like a controlled deflection. Well, the important thing to point out here is that this isn't meaning no 10 nanometer CPUs until 2022. Yeah. However there's no 10 nanometer for desktop platforms till right. 2022. Right. However, I've, they are ahead. expecting 10 nanometer Ice Lake and Lakefield CPUs to be appearing in late 2019. And that's why I want to bring up the roadmap itself for everyone to see. Because I think there, there's a little bit of nuance that you maybe can't see unless you're actually looking at this leaked roadmap so in current year 2019 mm -hmm. q1 q2 q3 we have coffee lake h which is for mobile we have present to everyone we have cabby lake u refresh which is their low power u series for uh, for low-end laptops, which is low, largely been replaced already by Whiskey Lake. Mm -hmm. We have the Coffee Lake H Refresh, which we should be seeing come out soon. Uh, the new 9750H, I know, has already been seen in the wild. We have the Y series, which are all the super low end parts with Amber Lake coming in quarter three of this year and Comet Lake coming quarter two next year. We have the S series, which is Socket H. Socket H, of course, is your desktop CPUs. Notice there's no new desktop CPUs planned beyond the ones we saw in that lineup that was released, which are not really new until Q2 of next year, and that's for Comet Lake S, and that's still 14 nanometer. I really have a hard time believing this roadmap. I really oh. do, because but we're potentially looking at, at a 12-core, 24-thread Ryzen in a few months. Uh, and if that's the case... They wouldn't have an answer for Ryzen until 2022? I don't know if I believe this. Well, the claim is that they're going to have a 10-core Comet Lake S CPU. It's not going to compete with a 12 nanometer, or uh, it's not going to compete with a 12-core, 24-thread, 7 nanometer Ryzen. It won't. There's no way. Of course... Again, this is a leak. Take it for what it is. Take it with a grain of salt, like you do with all leaks. <laughs> I just, I just, uh, I'm sorry, Ned, but I just, I have a really hard time believing this. I, to me, it's, again, it screams of deflection to throw off a potential competitor that's coming out in a few months. 
you know. That's entirely possible because we have heard from other sources of 10 nanometer parts coming out this year. Yeah. But the only ones that we know for sure that are 10 nanometer coming out this year are all mobile parts. Which is what they've typically done in the past whenever they've had a major node shift. You know, they release the the mobile parts first uh, because they're lower TDP parts and they can do, you know, the since they've got such a massive market for that, um, they can stomach some, some manufacturing defects as they're ironing out the issues with the node. Uh, so, I mean, they did the, they did this exact same thing with 14 nanometer. <clears throat> so it makes sense that they do it with 10, but they've been working on 10 for so long. I would have to believe that uh, they would make a node shift to 10 toward the end of the year or early next year. And that may be the case. We'll just have to see. Well, they're going to have to to remain competitive. I mean, we're seeing the... We're seeing the end of what is realistically possible at 14 nanometer with the Core i9-9900K. Uh, we know what a what a hog for heat it is. Well, yeah, and that thing consumes 95 watts of TDP if you leave it in a controlled environment. The minute you unlock that, then that thing is consuming 150 watts all day long so much. and that to me i mean it's still a, a fantastic part uh and five gigahertz is unbelievable but that i mean that screams to me that's that's the end of what they can possibly do at 14 nanometer and the fact that they that they can do that is amazing i just uh they have to remain competitive, and the only way they're going to do that is either by slashing prices, or which I don't see them doing, or um, doing a note shift. That's the only thing. I, I just, I don't see. Yeah, I, just, I, I can't. I'd be very surprised if this was actually the case. Well, if it is, even if it isn't the case. I think Intel realizes they have themselves in a pickle. Oh, I'm sure they do. I mean, they they have enough money that they can coast for a while. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, you know, to, 10 nanometer for them has been delayed, was it three times, four times already? Mm -hmm. Since 2017. That's when they were initially going to launch 10 nanometer. Yep. So that's two years ago. I mean, that's an eternity in tech speak. Yeah. Remember in 2017, 14 nanometer AMD Ryzen first gen mm -hmm. was what was coming out two yeah. years ago around this time. And 14 nanometer Intel was pretty cutting edge at that point. Yeah, uh, it wasn't very long after this that they released Cabby Lake, which was the successor to Skylake. Mm -hmm. Still a quad-core part. Yep. Uh, I recently picked up a Core i7-7700, which is the non-K variant of the Cabby Lake CPU. How is it? And it does solid in my H170 board. Nice. Uh, I really need to get a better RAM kit for it. Because right now, uh, it's only running on 8 gigs of DDR4-2800. But, you know, that was a budget kit that I picked up for 40 bucks. So, don't forget to remind the chief that you picked up his computer for 40 bucks. <laughs> By the way, chief. I love giving him stuff. He's such a good guy. Hmm. Let's see. So is that all of our news and, and topics? Well, all of our news, but we do have a couple of hardware deals. Oh, cool. Uh, so the first one, 
this is not the lowest price we've ever seen on this particular SSD. But after that killer deal on the Patriot Scorch last week, it was immediately a small capacity at 256 gigabytes. Mm -hmm. But for 36 bucks, you really couldn't beat it. No, you couldn't. I almost picked it up, honestly. I was super tempted. If you didn't pick up that deal, or you were wanting something with a bit more capacity, this is the Intel 660p. Now, yes, it does use QLC NAND, so it does have a bit of a performance penalty, but unlike the Scorch, this is PCIe 3.0 by 4. So mm -hmm. it uses the full four lanes instead of just two. And in addition, this is a 512 gigabyte SSD for 70 bucks. Technically $69.99. Yeah, and you'd be hard-pressed to find better performance at this price point. And you're right. This part does have a, a weakness, but it's an edge case. You know, as a scratch disk for large video files or almost every other use case, this is a blazingly fast part. And at this price point, man, wow. I mean... Yes, for an NVMe SSD, it is on the slower side. Mm -hmm. It is only, and I put only in quotes, <laughs> 1,500 megabytes per second reads and 1,000 megabytes per second writes. Now, that's roughly three times what a comparable SATA SSD can do. Right. And no, it's not as fast as a Samsung 970 Evo or a 970 Pro. But it also costs a fourth as much. Right. Basically, at 70 bucks, you'd be lucky to get a 970 Evo at the 256 gig variant. Exactly. Lucky. And given that this so. is a 512 gigabyte drive, which, oops, I am not sharing on screen. I am so sorry. <laughs> no, you're not. So you're the, laughing on you're you're laughing on the inside. I could feel it. And so again, specs: 1500 megabytes per second, a thousand megabytes per second writes uh, for random reads and random writes. Ninety thousand IOP reads, two hundred twenty thousand IOP writes. And has a mean time between failures of 1.6 million hours. <laughs> That's crazy. That's such a crazy endurance number. And so the 512 gigabyte model is currently $69.99. The one terabyte model is $114.99. But that sale... Well, it's going to end, unfortunately, before uh, you actually get to see this video, gentle viewer, which is why we highlighted this one instead. Well, so to put that in perspective, I think the 960, so the SATA variant of Samsung's one terabyte SATA drive, is running around $130 for the one terabyte. Right. And you're stuck at SATA speeds for that. Yep. yep. It's a solid drive. It's very good quality. And it, I mean, it's, it's a very solid drive, but so is Intel. Intel makes some extremely good SSDs. So 115 bucks for an NVMe, one terabyte. Not bad. And even if you can't afford that, $70 for a 512 gigabyte is no slouch either. Mm -hmm. And our final deal for the evening, I mentioned this one earlier, but if you were interested in the 1650, get this instead. Yes. This is the gigabyte Radeon RX 570 4 gigabyte card. It has the same four gigabytes as the 1650, but notice it starts off cheaper at $139, but it has a $20 mail-in rebate so that it only costs you $119.99. So is this the version that has a six pin uh, power 
connector. I want to say it does. Uh, nice looking card. Yeah, I was going to say the card is very nice. Uh, notice right. it has DVI, three display ports, and one HDMI out. It is a dual fan design. And let's see. Pretty sure it's got a six pin connector. Yeah, it does have, it actually has an eight oh, pin. Oh, wow. Okay. So you get a little bit extra power. Wonder if you can over. I I don't know as much about these uh, parts from a from a uh, overclocking standpoint. I don't know what they can do. I wonder if you can get 1.3 gigahertz out of these. Wouldn't surprise me. The core clock that they uh, release it at is 1244 megahertz. Although uh, Gigabyte does technically put an 11 megahertz OC mode on it, where it's at 1255. But uh, really, the OC mode is just there so that you can put your own overclock in <laughs> and still have gaming mode as a fallback. Mm -hmm. But this is not quite as good a deal as it was before when it had the two games bundled with it. But still at $120, this is $30 cheaper than the base model GTX 1650s, and it performs anywhere from 8 to 28% better. I don't understand why these aren't selling better. I really don't know. So I'm 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 flabbergasted, honestly. Like I just I don't understand. People uh, would rather have a crap part that costs more. I just don't understand. Uh, it claims that you need a 450 watt power supply. Eh, I would say that's technically true, but you could probably get by on a bit less than that. Yeah, you could probably get by with a decent 350 watt. Uh, all, it would really be dependent on what your amperage is on the 12 volt rail. True, but so to put that in perspective, a 2600, a Ryzen 5 2600 running at stock, non overclocked, with you know a, a typical system, 16 gigs of RAM, and an RX 580 at a gaming load, you're looking at around 270 watts total system power consumption. Mm hmm. And that's an extremely conservative number so well, we saw in the in the gaming results uh from the tech spot review the rx 570 in his system which admittedly he was using his test bench system which is a i believe is a 9900k mm -hmm. the system with the rx 570 was pulling 298 watts there you go so 450 watt is an extremely conservative figure. But yeah, basically as long as you have a solid 400 to 500 watt 80 plus bronze PSU, you're probably fine. Yeah, and I was just kind of farting around on Newegg. Uh, a single a single 12 volt rail 80 plus bronze power supply at 500 watts. The entry level pricing is 35 bucks. It's a no-brainer, man. Which is basically the price difference between the RX 570 and the GTX 1650. Really? Sorry. Funny how that works. Isn't it? <laughs> and with that, we have reached the end of our show. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've enjoyed the content that you've seen here, of course, you can check out our other TechForge videos here on the CrossForge Gaming YouTube channel. You can also check out the rest of our community over on the various social media sites. We have links to our Discord, our Facebook, our Twitter, and all of our other social media stuff down below. You can check us out five nights a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash crossforgegaming. In the meantime, I've been Dynamo Ned. This has been TechForge. And remember, when life has you down, Jesus loves you, and Forge on. <laughs>